Live on WFLA Now. Feel good and live your best life with Bloom Health Club. Here's Gail Guayardo. Welcome to Bloom Health Club. Today we're taking a deep dive, literally and figuratively, with a man who broke world records living underwater for 100 days in a mission combining education for kids, ocean conservation research, and the study of physiological and psychological impacts of compression on the human body. I'm your host, Gail Guayardo, joined alongside lead producer and digital reporter, Brody Waddell, and Dr. Deep Sea himself, Dr. Joseph Dettori. <laughs> Dr. Dettori, what a pleasure it is to have you on Bloom Health Club. Great to see you. I love being here. Great studio. Yeah, it's so much fun. Yeah. So first of all, tell us what it was like living underwater for 100 days. You broke world records. Yeah, uh, it, it was actually fun and, and quite humbling. I mean, I got the opportunity to do great things. I got the opportunity to talk to all these people about, you know, uh, preserving, protecting, rejuvenating the marine environment, astronauts, marine scientists, um, you know, ichthyologists. We're, we're talking like the world's best in their field. Uh, sponge researchers that were talking to me about, hey, Joe, here's what you have to do to preserve and protect the human environment. Coral researchers, here's how to replant coral. So I learned a whole heck of a lot, and then we passed it on to a bunch of uh, students. You know, I think it's really important to point out uh, that I've known Dr. DeTori for many, many years. And this isn't just some guy who decided to go underwater for a publicity gimmick. He has been a diver for our U.S. military, and he's been working with hyperbaric treatment here in the Tampa Bay area as a leader of many, many studies about the impact of hyperbaric treatment and how it impacts our health. And so you've been doing this your whole life, really. Right. It's a lifetime under pressure. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, physically and uh, and metaphorically. Certainly. So you learned a lot of things about yourself living underwater for a hundred days. I mean, mm. you sleep better, you think better. What else? Yeah, uh, so you 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 have better cholesterol underwater. It appears, uh, right? You have. <laughs> we we talked about this a little bit, but uh, so you have lower cortisol. So if you have a decrease in cortisol, you have an increase in testosterone, which is great, right? Yeah, so it nice. even improves your sex life. Is what you're saying? <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a yes. If, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, so little things like that, but it's the second and third order consequences, right? It's the it's the taking better care of your body. There are lots of known mechanisms of action of hyperbaric medicine and it's been around since the 1600s this is not something new right so every time we do a dive in the navy every time we go out and we do something these are the known mechanisms that actually happen so we're just kind of uh we're just kind of playing off of them and solidifying them for the rest of the world and making sure that you know that you have an option now you have a clinic here in the tampa bay area undersea oxygen therapy and you're thinking oh well you know when divers go down they get what's it called bends the bends yeah the bends yeah. they get the bends sickness. and so like you know so you're thinking well what else is this good for but a divers but no you're finding through a lot of research that hyperbaric chamber treatment where you're breathing in 100 percent medical grade oxygen helps in so many different ways, even with traumatic brain injury, which is something that you personally suffer from. Sure. And uh, so so one of the things that I do is I, I teach medicine at uh, Morrisani Medical College, and I teach these doctors the mechanism of action of hyperbaric medicine so that they can then look at it, close their eyes, and apply it across the spectrum of diseases that we have coming out, problems, issues, so that they could go, huh, I wonder, maybe we can use hyperbaric oxygen as a first line of defense, as opposed to like a third or a fourth or a fifth. Oh, down the road, you know, when they're getting ready to amputate the guy's leg. Yeah, let's try hyperbarics before. And then they go, oh, it doesn't work because it's the last thing we did. So, 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 it, it, so studies like for PTSD, yep. you know, brain injury. Um, so many other things, you know, there's a video of me there when I went ah. to visit you guys. It, it even steps into the anti-aging realm. How does yeah. that work? So it steps into the anti-aging realm by, uh, by increasing the length of what we call telomeres, which are on the end of the chromosome. So if you, if you look at the chromosome and you look at the very end of the chromosome, you have this little tip. This little tip that's on the end 
is how many times you can reproduce that cell. So when you reproduce that cell, you whisk one of those away. One of those is gone. One of those is gone. One of those is gone. And when all of them are gone, well, then you can't reproduce that cell anymore. That's called cellular senescence, cell death, right? When you can lengthen them in hyperbaric medicine, and Shea Afradi just did a study on it, it's a terrific study, and between 25 and 33% increase in the length of your telomeres. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Between 25% and 30% increase in longevity. It's, a, it's a, almost a direct correlation. It's not perfect, but it's almost a direct correlation. We're also working studies on the Horvath clock to see how well you, we actually do what you call anti-aging. So we're actually working those studies right now. That's kind of cool. And then sleep. When you were living mm. underwater doing experiments day after day, week after week, um, you realized that where you were getting 30 to 35 percent deep sleep, which, by the way, I would I would do anything to get that much sleep right now. I don't even get that. You were getting that reparative sleep at a much almost like what triple the or du double double that double. amount. So 66 percent in deep and REM, which is just it's unheard of, right? So you you sleep for six seven hours a night and. Four and a half of it is in deep and REM sleep. That's where you learn. That's where you relearn. That's where you overview. That's where you task manage. That's where you take it from short-term storage to long-term storage, right? I mean, this is how we learn. So talk to me, because people that are listening right now will be like, okay, so this doctor, he lived underwater for 100 days. Um, he has a hyperbaric clinic that people come to. How do we bridge the divide between the science of it and the treatment and how people can start changing their health and changing their lives? Right. I mean, as you know, changing your health, changing your life starts with you, right? So it starts with your diet. I mean, you, you know, because you're going through a lot of things that you work on and, and you work on yourself for years and years. I've known you that you're in the gym every morning. So if you start with that and you do your workout in the morning, you, you have a better chance of getting forward down the day. But when you want to take and apply these things that we are looking at across a broad spectrum of diseases and issues, you start from the beginning, you start working your way down the run, and you find that maybe hyperbaric medicine may be able to help you a little bit. You don't have to live underwater to get the advantages of hyperbaric medicine. You can go to a local clinic, and not just mine. Now, you don't have to go to mine, but just go to anyone and see what they can do for you because you might have a problem that we could apply some sort of mechanism towards fixing. So, Brody, do you have any questions for Dr. Deepsea? Because that's how he's fondly known. Now that's become his name. Here we go. Do you think that there was any, like, specific rituals or habits you got into with sleep down there that might have contributed to those changes? Absolutely not. So, so I am an, I'm a no-sleep guy. Because I had a traumatic brain injury, I sleep very poorly. So I am meticulous about my sleep routine. The phone goes away an hour before bedtime. There's no blue light in my life an hour before bedtime. I sit in my room. I deep breathe. I do meditative breathing. I do cleansing a cleansing breathing. I work through all of my problems. I have a pad next to my bed that I write stuff down. Temperature is very, very cold in the room always. It's very, very dark in the room. Everything's taped black. I mean, I'm meticulous at home. Yeah, you're in it. Just like underwater, and I'm the exact same way, right? You keep your you keep your melatonin in uh, producing when it gets dark, and then you don't have to worry about taking melatonin because your body actually produces it. You know, your magnesium, you keep your magnesium at the right spot so you don't have to worry about taking magnesium. Mm -hmm. So when I did that, when I went underwater, I was like, after about the first week, holy mackerel, I feel really, really great. Like, I was almost a little scared. Why do I feel so good? And then sure enough, I'm pulling back the data. And as the data is coming in, it's looking like I'm doubling my sleep. And I'm like, this is incredible. So what do you do with all that data? Because I'm glad you brought that up. You, 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 you've, right. you've come above, you're on, you know, earth with the rest of us, we were always on earth, but I mean, you're, you're standing footed on firm ground with the yep. rest of us. And you, you came up with all of this incredible research that you will then use to help people heal. Sure. That's exactly it. So we have a 10 person medical team, uh, and we're going through all of the 10,000 plus data points, right? So it's a lot of numbers crunching right now. So this is the boring part of science. Like we showed kids the fun part, the diving, the swimming, the uh -huh. being out there. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part of science. The boring part is when we go back and we crunch 10,000 mm -hmm. plus numbers, right? And then we look for statistical significance and variability and all those p-values and all that. Ugh. But 
once we figure all that out, our intention is to publish this. Now, we have some really great preliminary results that are trending towards some good things, but we're going to publish this at the World Extreme Medicine Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland in November. So we're going to Scotland and I'm going to wear a kilt. <laughs> so all right. You ought to come. <laughs> That's a whole nother story for a whole right. nother edition of Bloom Health Club. So how did but, it feel when you resurfaced and you got back on solid ground? Like, it, was it any different? Like, did you, had you forgotten what? I, you know, what happened is, so I'm in the car on the way home from the first night and, and we're driving and it's a rainstorm. Now, mind you, I haven't seen rain in a hundred days, but it's Florida and it rains mm -hmm. all the time. Right. So we're driving down the road and it's going so fast by me, the rain's flickering. And I'm like, you're not going to pass between that truck and that, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I was a little bit like life comes at you really fast. So I was not prepared for that. Uh, I was a little bit myopic, which has now come back. So mm. I got nearsighted. Why? Because I could only focal point about 15 feet. That was about as far as I could see on a general basis. Well, your vision is 20, 20 because you see things 20 feet away, like they are 20 feet away. I never got an opportunity to look 20 feet away because I could only ever look at 15. Yeah. So think about this for space travel. If we space travel and we have, we have a short focal point, what are we going to do when we land on the red planet and we're going to all be myopic and be like, I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, talk to us about the, the, the living conditions of being underwater. Like how is that built? It's down in, in Key Largo? So it's down in Key Largo, Jules Undersea Habitat. Uh, and basically it's uh, two tubes that are about uh, eight feet in diameter by 18 feet long. But realistically, that seems like it's a lot of space. It's really not. Uh, there's about three feet of usable space by maybe 10 or 15 feet of usable space on each side. And that's basically all you had the entire time. So, for instance, I went to take a walk when I got out. As soon as I got out, I went for a walk. And it was like, oh, hey, let's go for a three-mile walk. I came back from that walk with shin splints because I hadn't taken more than five steps in 100 right. days, right? It was like, whoa, wait a minute. I totally spaced that. So, Were there times that you were down there and you were thinking to yourself, what am I? why did I take on this challenge? Uh, so, specific, uh, day 12, I cracked my tooth. What? I cracked my tooth. So my mower in the back on the top, uh, the second one in, I cracked it 12 days into the mission. So I called the dentist and like talking to the, uh, talking to all the people who do surgery and, and root canals. And they're like, yeah, well, you absolutely cracked your tooth. Um, we will see you in about 90 days or so when you come out of the water. So yeah, things like that. Yeah. That's one of those. Oh, wow. Really wish I would have done better dental stuff beforehand. Uh, day 92, I, uh, I got a sinus infection. So when I got the sinus infection, this side felt clear, this side felt unclear. That meant that I was doing this spinning thing. So it was me in a bucket and we were hanging out and we were real close friends. And it's just, it's just, but that's the yeah. way it is, right? This is, it happens. We're going to Mars. It's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? People get sick. There's things, there's allergens, there's dust, things come up. Your, your whatever flares up, you know, something, space dust got in my nose, whatever, you know. But things like that, we're going to need to learn how to have to learn how to deal with So that. how were you eating? Like, were you supplementing? Like, you weren't getting sunlight or anything like that? I was so not getting. So the great thought. So the one supplement that I was taking was 2000 IU of vitamin D. That was the medical team got mm -hmm. together. Like, it wasn't just me, right? There was this whole medical team. And they're like, hey, listen, the one thing you got to take is vitamin D. And right. that's not even a lot. 2,000 IU is not a lot, but we needed a, a minimum amount just to make sure your health was up, right? So that was the only supplement that I took while I was down there. Otherwise, I ate the exact same thing. And I, you, you know me very well. I am a creature of habit, right? Like I get up in the morning and I have three eggs for breakfast. Why? Because it's easy. Three eggs. They go in the thing. I break them up. Right. And, yeah, three eggs. Boom. Uh, for lunch, I have a salad with protein on it. Uh, and then for dinner, I have like something green and protein. And that's basically it. I don't eat carbs, generally speaking, unless somebody brings me M&Ms. I got a problem. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's it's your weak spot. Now oh, I know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Peanut M&Ms. Sorry. Uh, but, you, you know, short of that, I'm, I'm really clean eating. So when I was doing that, same amount that I eat when I'm on the surface, I lost about 12 pounds in the first 25 days. And I was like, uh-uh, this is no good. Yeah. So I had to almost double my protein intake. So I went from, so I'm, I was I was 100 kilos. Yeah. I would do one gram of protein per kilogram body weight. So I bumped that up to about 1.75. So I was doing 175 kilograms of protein, wow. which is crazy because oh, I didn't want to keep losing weight. That would have been really bad. Yeah, no kidding. Known side effect of hyperbaric medicine. Weight loss. No, 
increased metabolism. So oh. if you increase metabolism, a consequence of increased metabolism is weight loss. Absolutely. If you stay on the same diet, but like that didn't even register with me. I knew that right up front, but that didn't even register with me when I got in the hole until 25 days later, they took yeah. my weight and they're like, Whoa, you lost a lot of weight. That's significant for me. I mean, I'm a hundred kilos. It's what I am. It's right. what I've always been, you know? So were there any like other big physiological changes that you noticed being down there? Like cortisol went from, you know, 70s or so which is normal in the morning mm -hmm. it's highest in the morning peaked in the morning to single digits to single digits yeah. well that's because of reactive oxygen species so reactive oxygen species goes up cortisol goes down i mean these are all known right yeah. but when you put them all together nobody's ever stayed underwater this long it. yeah. and it's like wow that's cool so you were just like euphoric the whole time? Oh my goodness, yes. Really? really? Oh yeah, I was euphoric. And like I said, I had a 13% increase in uh, in my synaptic uh, connectivity mm -hmm. or what they call coherence. And I had a 5% reduction in phase lag, which means that going from one node to the other took 5% less time. Really? And you haven't had like a crash or a come down or anything sort of? Oh like no, I'm back to being I'm back to being Joe right <laughs> okay. now. Yeah, it's yeah. like coming yeah. back from vacation, oh, right? right? Which leads me to my next question and that we all can't live under under the sea for a hundred no. days, but we could go explore hyperbaric treatments. And so talk to me about what that does and how it translates to making us feel better. Because I think I really want the listeners and the viewers to understand how everything that you went through for those hundred a hundred, excuse me, days. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, it's funny, I wrote that in the script and they were like, you must have been really tired, Gail. You said he lived under there for a hundred years. We don't, <laughs> he but, looks great, <laughs> He looks <right>. amazing. <laughs> Stops aging. Um, yeah. But for a hundred days, you lived under there and... So when we go in, how long are you in the hyperbaric chamber? You know, how often do you need mm -hmm. to do it? When can people see changes? Sure. Generally speaking, uh, it, we do sessions that are about an hour long. So that means about 76 minutes total, right? 10 minutes to compress down to there and then, you know, six minutes to come up and then 60 minutes of actual treatment time. So it's an hour and a half out of your life. So but if you have to do hyperbarics consistently, there are people that are like, oh, just come in once a week. That's not going to work. It's not going to do what you need it to do because there are great things that come out of hyperbarics, but they don't come when you do it kind of haphazardly, right? Mm -hmm. You have to do it consistently. Remember, I'm a scientist. So all I know is what the scientific papers say. So it says, oh, you have to do 20 treatments at this partial pressure of oxygen to get this eight times increase in your stem cell proliferation, right? So we can increase your stem cells by eight times. That's that's terrific, you know, but I can't do it haphazardly. I can't do that once a week, every other week. I don't know what's going to happen, but we know that if you do it in a row, you can be an anti, a powerful anti-inflammatory. We know that if you continue to do it, it can reduce pain. We know that if you continue to do it, it can uh, it, uh, increase telomere length. Uh, you know, it, it has a lot of second and third order consequences and, and some of them are great. I mean, great, great things that you can apply. Um, so, you can apply this. So a uh, hundred days underwater, now you're translating it into taking care of people. Talk to me about what you did before you did your 100 days underwater experiment. Cause I know you did so many studies. So let, let's talk about what you rolled out prior to taking a deeper dive into this kind of research. Oh, sure. So uh, we've been trying to work on traumatic brain injury and PTSD, and that's been going on at my clinic for some time now. Since uh, since I retired from the Navy after 28 years of service and Admiral McRaven allowed me or offered me the opportunity to sit on the preservation of the force and family. You see that 22 people a day are, are losing their life over, over not feeling good about their traumatic brain injury. So what do we do? Well, we have to do something. And there's a lot of people out there that just want to talk about it and give you a tincture of time. And a tincture of time is not going to cure anything. I don't care what you say. It's not going to work, especially for these type one operators, these high level operators, you know, CEOs of companies, right? Uh, you know, professional football players at the top of their game, right? You tell them, hey, it just takes a tincture of time. That's not going to cut it. So if we don't do something, we are going to end up losing lives. So we had to do something. That's why we did that clinic. So I started that and it came from my traumatic brain injury. So I thought I was curing traumatic brain injury by using hyperbaric oxygen and it increases cerebral blood flow. And that is terrific. However, it wasn't enough. So when I had my TBI, I came back, I said, let me out of the hospital. I want to treat myself. So I treated myself in my clinic. And after about a month of treatments, it just wasn't enough. And I fell into that, uh, 
I, I became despondent. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. I was in such a bad spot. I was crying on a daily basis. And, and I tell this to people not to like get you to have sympathy for me, but to get you to see that I'm a regular guy and this happened to me. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I mean, I was a military guy and I got banged around plenty. <laughs> Trust me, I got banged around plenty in the military. Right. But when I got hit by a car and T-boned and got loss of consciousness in the car, I was just a regular guy going to work. Right. Pow. And I'm out. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. If I could be crying on my on my uh, desk in my office, anybody can be. If I can be angry, so angry that I want to pull the steering wheel off, Gail, you wouldn't even believe it. It was that bad. And I said, I got to do something different because if not, I'm going to end up being one of those people that takes his own life because I could see that happening. I could almost see my way right through that, right? So I said, but I'm a good Catholic boy and I got to do something, right? I have to do everything before I try that, right? Because that's not going to work. So I did everything. I was driving home one day and I saw ice, 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 $5. I said, huh. If you decrease peripheral perfusion by getting in an ice bath, you must increase cerebral perfusion. It, it's physics. It has to work, right? So I got in the ice bath at home. I bought ice. I got in the ice bath at home. And I did that for weeks and weeks and weeks and felt so much, so much great things coming from the ice really? bath. Really? Because people talk about this like cold therapy and they say it's just magical. Yeah, it's like the new thing right it, now. It, but see, it's not even a thing. So what you get out of this that that people like, I didn't even know when I was going into it because I was still in that traumatic brain injury state. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know how much I was getting out of it. You get something called a cold shock protein, which is nothing more than a stress protein. But guess what? We used to be stressed because we had saber tooth tigers chasing us for crying out loud. We really don't have real stress right now. I mean, this where your, your meal, you can go get whatever meal you want. You're probably pretty good. And you know, you're not going to have the most most people are not, right? We're, we're very fortunate to have that uh, in our lives. However, if you don't have those stresses in the life, the immune system takes turns, right? It goes, oh, well, I don't have anything real to kind of, uh, you know, complain about. So I'm going to complain about this little thing. I'm going to complain about this little thing. So that's what I said. If you can get those stress proteins up, you can get a better immune system coming out of it. So you're saying you're combining hyperbaric with cold ice therapy, which you also brought into your clinic. Yep ice bath therapy. But remember, I tried everything. Remember that whole, I want to do it before I go down that deep, dark road right. forever, right? So I did neurofeedback therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I brought these people to me. Structural energetic therapy. All these providers now work with me at my traumatic brain injury healing center so that we can take and go, what do you need? Oh, you need some peptides because you're a little low on this. Let's let's bump you up with some BPC-157 and then put some ginsenosan on you. And then we'll get you doing this and doing that. And then hyperbaric therapy and then we're going to do neurofeedback therapy and then uh, you know synaptic pathway restoration by this neuroplasticity games you'll see these so online. there's this whole new approach to yeah. dealing with something 100 that the old school treatment left with dramatic uh, uh, rates of suicide yes exactly right right so people will come to me and they'll do an intensive outpatient protocol and they'll stay with me for the entire month 28 days long and they'll be with me for seven and a half hours a day. People are like, I don't have that kind of time. I'm like, really? Either make time for, for your wellness or play with the illness that you're going to get later on down the road. It's your choice. Yeah. But I was in that extremis. I was looking dead in the face of that illness. And I said, I got to take the time to do this myself. So I did everything in here. Red light therapy. And I, and, and I look at it from a scientific perspective. Listen, there's not a lot of science behind red light. It kind of sort of maybe it's going to work, but mm -hmm. it's definitely not going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. So if it might work and it's not going to hurt you, go ahead and do it. I just throw it in my program. And I was like, well, how much? Well, it's like, I, I don't care. I don't care about the price. I'm trying to fix people. And well, didn't you get a lot of grants when you initially started launching this? I mean, you started doing, <laughs> no. All this came out of the International Bank of Joe and my four <laughs> other friends that I have. Literally, I have three other friends that I, we just have a circle uh, every, uh, every New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. We have a circle and go, what did we do good this year? What did we do bad this year? What, what do we want to do different for next year? Okay. And then we got, I said, I want to move the needle on, on traumatic brain injury. And one guy was a football player, a uh, very famous football player, local here. And he said, what do you know about that? Let's talk about that. And then the other guy is a finance guy. And then the other guy is another PhD from the university. And this, these are my boys, right? These are my brain trust boys. Right, right? Right, right. And we're like, okay, we can do it. And they're like, all right, go. What do you need? And I'm like, well, nothing really. They're like, what? We need a person. Okay, let, let's get some people. So they gave me a Super Bowl ring wearing MVP football player. And then I got a military guy. And we said, both of you guys are going to do this together for 28 days. And they were like, really? I said, yep. They're like, how much? I'm like, free. 
They're like, wait, what? I was like, yeah. They come in and then you got to see the testimonies on the webpage. It's, it's ridiculous. So when those guys came in, you know, the wife halfway through is like, hey, what would you, what'd you do to my husband? I got my husband back. This is amazing. It's incredible. He's yeah. lacing up his cleats. I'm like, he's like, nice. I'm going back in the game. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You are in your forties. You are not Tom Brady. Yeah. You ain't going back, like, <laughs> I was going to say, out. was it Tom oh, Brady? It was not Tom Brady. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But then the military guy was like, listen, man, you saved my life. Now, mm -hmm. now I'm out there at an event on the weekend after you let me out. And I saw these people hurting and I helped them. I saved three people's lives at that event. So I was like, I'm not crying, you're crying. Oh my God, <laughs> right? that like, is incredible. This is what you do when you push, you put it out in the universe and you know, it's like, wow, this actually comes back. No kidding, we are helping people and then they're helping people and so on and so on, maybe, so we'll see. What about COVID long haulers? Because no. that's another yeah. big area. You hear about that all the time when it comes to hyperbaric treatment. So COVID loves to live in the type 2 pneumocytes, so uh, it, it actually takes out the type 2 pneumocytes, which make it hard for you to breathe. It also affects the carrying capacity in your hemoglobin. Sorry, that's probably really technical stuff, but what that means is it, it makes it harder to transport oxygen to your brain, right? So we know this, right? So we can help carry more oxygen to your brain so that your brain can start healing itself. Mm -hmm. So the brain fog we see great results. And I mean, it's still a study, it's ongoing, it's not a nail in the coffin yet. However, comma, we're helping people, right? It works so well that workman's comp actually pays. You're oh, kidding. Nice. And workman's comp doesn't pay for anything. No, that is so, true, But you know, don't. if you're looking yeah. to get people back to work and workman's comp comes to you and says, hey, we'll pay you, no, you know that something's going on. But once again, it's preliminary and we're still in that study and it's probably gonna last for years and years and years. Because guess what? We're at the we're at the start of what's going on. The tip of the iceberg with this, yeah, yeah. The tip of the iceberg. Without a doubt. It's a coming. Brody, any more questions for Dr. Deepsea? Well, this might be backing up a little bit, but how did you like physically and mentally prepare yourself to live underwater for 100 days? So in the in the U.S. Navy, I was a saturation diver, which means the divers that stay in underwater for a long period of time. Okay. So I'm very uniquely qualified in that aspect. There's, you know, a couple of hundred uh, saturation divers in the Navy, not thousands. So, you know, uh, I, I had that unique perspective. Uh, but realistically, that medical team got around me. And I mean, oh boy, I had these people that were like, okay, here's what you got to do beforehand. Here's what we're going to do afterwards. Here's the test. The te you know, you, you look at the, um, the GAD7, the PQM9, the Beck Depression Index, the Beck Anxiety Index. So I did all those standard tests beforehand. And boy, you think you know yourself until you're alone in a room looking at yourself for mm -hmm. days and days and days on end. I'm not saying that I never had visitors, but I had very limited amounts of visitors for the entire time I was down there. And it was a really big, uh, you know, it's a really small tube and you get to think and talk to yourself an awful lot. So you do take a good look inside and you learn a lot about yourself. All right. That was my next question. Being away from the hustle and bustle of daily life, was there any like particular like serenity or like that you're carrying with you now that you just like oh well, yeah you know? oh yeah like i'm trying now you know it happens right but i am trying not to just sweat the small stuff like mm -hmm. here's the one thing that i understood right off the bat right that it's it's maybe five days into the mission eight days into the mission electrical storm power goes out generator doesn't kick on it's pitch black it's dark and it's at night and you're underwater. It is nothing. It's nothing. So yeah. I have a little battery, you know, I have a headlamp battery. Yeah, who do you thing. call when that right, happens? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so who do you call and how do you call? Because guess what? The little phones were all work. electric. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no power, no nothing, right? So you're like, okay, I have no control here. I can only work on the things that I can control. Mm. Think about that parallel to the rest of your life. Like you can only work on the things that you can control. Wow, that guy's cut in front of me in line. What am I going to do? Am I really going to get out of my car and run up to him and whatever? No, no, I can't control it. Just he might be having a bad day. Let that go. And once you let this stuff roll off, you're like, oh, man, I'm so much happier. I am so much happier now because, look, man, just let it go. That song, Frozen, oh, my God. Let it they go. were so, so right. True. Elsa yeah. was on to something. Yeah. So now you're getting world recognition. You're a uh. major keynote speaker. You're out there spreading the good world word. Tell us about what you're doing now. So I just got back from NeuroCon where I presented as a keynote speaker on traumatic brain injury and I let people in on this program, which is great, right? We, we're letting them in and people are like, well, how much are you selling it for? I'm like, nope, here you go. I'll give it to you, the whole thing. Here you go. Why? Because 
people are dying, guys. People are dying, right? And if it's gotten, if it's getting that bad, we need to do something about it as a society. The whole world needs to start fixing people. So it's like, what can we do? So, so one of the doctors, uh, the uh, medical students, stands up and goes, "Okay, I can't afford all that stuff for my clinic. What can I do?" And I said, "Anything, everything. Start with bags of ice from a ice." you know, bin and start in a, uh, a bathtub and start like I started. And then before you know it, it'll work and don't worry about the money. And he was like, he comes up to me afterwards. He's like, you totally inspired me. I was down this route for medicine and now I'm going down this route, this whole other route. And I was like, that's a beautiful thing, that, right? Right. Got to bring some change. And when you're doing something that makes a difference in people's lives, that's saving lives and can be the future of medicine that is pretty incredible, Dr. Dottori. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. When the nine-year-old girl of one of the people that I treated said, thank you, I finally got my daddy back. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what oh, we're doing please. is good. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. if it helps a little. Is it perfect? No. But perfect is the enemy of good enough. Mm -hmm. Always remember that. People are going to get better. It's just, you know, you got to work it. Right. Well, thanks for being on the show and thanks for everything that you do. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Dr. Dottori. Dr. Right. For everything health and wellness, check out bloomtampabay.com. Thank you, everybody.